small time to wait because we are streaming simultaneously in Zoom and in YouTube, but now everything seems to be working. I have lots of thumbs up from the other side of this room. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much for joining in. A good afternoon to everyone. Bon après-midi à tous. Uh, we are starting with session number two, uh, which will be a high-level panel discussion on the role and competitiveness of EU's research and development for sustainable agriculture. Please again use the question and answers feature in Zoom for addressing questions, which will be summarized at the end, and we will try to insert as many questions as possible. Not to waste time, I just introduce our wonderful moderator for today, a welcome, uh, Madeline Fiaschi, uh, Managing Director at Science Business. I think most of the people who are in Brussels know Madeline quite well. She uh, has joined Science Business in 2011, and she leads the company's operation and growth strategy. But before that, Madeline has had an extensive experience in the European Commission itself, so she knows quite well what's happening in Brussels between the different stakeholders. Marlene, we are very, very happy that you are today with us. Warm welcome to the other panelists and I hand the screen over to you. Thank you, Lucien, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction. So for those who don't know, uh, Science Business is a news and communications company specialized in uh, research and innovation policies uh, at the European level. And indeed, I will serve as moderator for this session that we look at the role and the competitiveness of the EU's research and development uh, for sustainable agriculture. Uh, for those who haven't followed this morning's session, I suggest I just start with a quick word of context. Um, well, since the European Court of Justice ruled uh, in July 2018 that modern precision genome editing or novel breeding techniques remain subject to the 2001 uh, EU directive banning uh, GMOs, the pressure to reverse the legislation have significantly increased. And as we heard in the previous sessions, the scientific community has pushed uh, to rethink the EU's um, GMO regulatory framework. In fact, in the summer 2019, researcher from, researchers from about, uh, about 120 institutes around Europe said uh, the EU's ban, and I quote, no longer correctly reflects the current state of scientific knowledge. So the statement is strong, and that's one of the things that we will uh, cover with this panel. The European Commission is currently working on a study on the status of novel genomic uh, techniques and the Union law, with a report due in April uh, 2021. And as a result of this study, a proposal for a new legislation could possibly, and I say possibly, uh, take place. So uh, during this session, uh, we will really be looking at the policy landscape. So we will run discussion as a policy discussion. And these, the objective is really to understand the state of play around the research uh, on novel breeding techniques in Europe and understand their role or their potential role in the transition towards uh, sustainable agriculture. So by crossing the views of policymakers, representatives from the industry and from the research community, uh, we will aim through an open debate to better understand what is at stake here for Europe and really assess the odds of uh, seeing the legislation on genetic engineering and resulting crops uh, evolving in the coming years. So uh, with this thread of introduction, uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce the six panelists uh, that, we, that, that have kindly agreed to be here with us today. So first of all, Jola van Kramen uh, Taubadel, you're a German member of the European Parliament with the group of the Greens, European Free Alliance. Uh, there we also have with us Wolfgang Butcher, Director General for Agriculture and Rural Development uh, at the European Commission. Uh, also from the European Commission, Sabine Judicher, uh, Director for Food and Feed Safety, as well as Innovation in the Director, uh, Directorate General for Health and Food Safety, so European Commission. And, uh, and we also have with us Petra uh, Jorash, a Manager 
plant breeding innovation advocacy at Euroseed, a trade association representing the voice of European seed sector. Uh, Pekka Pesonen, uh, who has just joined us, uh, Secretary General uh, of COPA and COGECA European Farmers Association, and finally Dir Kinze, Science Director of the Center for Plant Systems Biology at the Flemish Institute for Biotechnology at Ghent University. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, before we kick off the discussion, just uh, as Lucien mentioned, we will take questions from the audience, so don't hesitate to, uh, to ask some questions. Uh, I promise that we'll take at least some. I understand that the activity on the chat is uh, quite intensive, uh, but we, we will take some, a few questions. And you can also interact on Twitter, and the hashtag of the conference being uh, genome editing, or you can also use the two other hashtags, uh, hashtag Leopoldina and hashtag DAG. With this, uh, let's deep dive uh, into the topic and Yola. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, as, as you may have, well, as you will notice very quickly, since we are running that as a policy discussion, all the speakers kindly agreed that I address them by their first name. So thank you for that. Uh, so Viola, there is, a, well, the, one of the light motive of this conference is very much to look at linkages uh, between the different stakeholders. Uh, so plant breeding techniques are linked to research and innovation, also to sustainable agriculture, and also to consumer protection. And, and while we're still debating uh, on the rightness of novel breeding techniques, <clears throat> we know that research and innovation have created or is still creating uh, new results. At the same time, uh, the agribusiness follows its own logic and in parallel consumers want more quality of agricultural products for the same price. Unfortunately, at this point in time, a common agenda is lacking. So my question to you is how to achieve such a common agenda? Well, first of all, <coughs> oh, sorry, you know, it starts again. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on this extraordinary panel. Uh, since I was listening also to the first session, it is always very hard to speak after such uh, distinguished um, experts. Uh, uh, such as my team and, and uh, um, the, the lawyer, uh, the legal um, expert, and uh, why they really try to figure out the pros and cons in a very structured and systematic way, uh, while they also referred uh, to the very politi politicized uh, debate on, on, on one hand, which is, of course, right. <clears throat> so I think we have to also look <clears throat> what is the track record of the... I'm so sorry. <clears throat> oh. What is the track record of the uh, uh, um, genome um, uh, editing and what is the track record of uh, uh, transgenetic uh, experience? And um, what my team has, for example, um, uh, focused very much on, and I, I, I can, I can uh, go align with it, that with genome editing, uh, we really would have um, um, an improvement for smaller and also public uh, organizations. But also, I think, from the um, European Parliament side, um, I think we have to introduce better scrutiny instruments and also uh, try to find out how to oversight really this research uh, and uh, maybe new uh, common agenda when we would like to talk about. It's no secret that especially our group is uh, very reluctant to have uh, or to come along, uh, to, to come out with a, let's say, new proposal um, for a GMO um, um, legal uh, basis, uh, especially because the precautionary uh, principle and, and uh, the non-GMO labeling uh, is of utmost importance for the majority um, of the group, but also um, for many of the biological-based uh, and organic-based farmers. Uh, so there is, let's say, a big um, a, a trade of, of uh, let's say, the innovation part and how much in, uh, in genome editing um, 
uh, sort um, of uh, genome editing um, breeding could be implemented as an organic. Uh, we have not even talked about that because, of course, this is not really an issue which is debated now and could then be also part of a real sustainable um, agriculture. Uh, while I see right now the reservations is absolutely great and it's not just in our party, it is all over the society and I think this is also important to say that the consumer preferences right now is very much, I think in, in Germany it's even three quarters uh, very much against um, the use or um, yeah, the consumption of uh, of genome um, driven food and that makes it very difficult to explain what is genome editing uh, um, um, what is the the new um, or the innovation of genome editing why is it different from uh, transgenic uh, uh, sorts and so what is the real progress and why is it so difficult now uh, to explain a little bit more in detail for the broader uh, audience and for the consumers um, uh, the non uh, the, the non detection um, of uh, this new breeding and sort. So um, I think that many of the let's say reservations are rooted in uh, what have Matim also mentioned the patterns of life monopolies, market monopolies, um, industrialized food systems. So if uh, the, uh, the, the innovative part of uh, the uh, breeding uh, industry can really prove that uh, the majority of the new breeding sorts uh, would cover this public good and would really go into sorts which could contribute uh, to uh, malnutrition and could really um, um, uh, give a solution for uh, this the, the question of food shortages and so on and so forth. Uh, this would maybe make a difference, but uh, so far I think the social and economical questions are not really in the focus, are not really the priority of the commercialized uh, uh, breeding and sorts, and that makes it very difficult right now to uh, even start a discussion. Thank you. That sets the scene very nicely. You've raised a number of very important points here. So I think we will come back to, to some of them uh, a bit later because uh, the, the reality is that, uh, that the European food system is embedded in the world market. And there are different ways of handling the question of, uh, of GMOs and so genetic engineering around the world. And Sabine, uh, can I come to you? Because uh, the, one of the main issues that consumers have is indeed uh, the, the potential role of GMOs on health and agriculture, food and health are very uh, closely linked. So can, can I ask you, uh, well, how can we make sure, or, or first, how can we define a good regulation for novel, for novel agricultural products if we cannot detect the technology behind it. And one of the issue or one of the differences uh, around the world is in fact the disclosure of the, the use of these techniques. So what do you think? How, how can we define a good regulation for novel agricultural uh, products? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks for, for inviting me. Thanks for the question and thanks for the opportunity for the European regulator to, to speak on, on the topic, because that's what, what we are in, in that sense. I mean, me and my, my colleagues, we are responsible for the authorization of GMOs for the European market. So maybe to give a bit of, of uh, context here, as you, as you rightly say, um, we, have, we have existing EU legislation. If I may slightly correct, uh, the function is not to ban GMOs, but it is giving a frame to allow um, genetically modified organisms safe, safely onto the EU market, um, which means, and there I come to your question on health, that prior to allowing these products on the market, we have a very, very thorough safety assessment, which is done on basis of science. It's a long process, it's a cumbersome process for, for the applicants, um, but it is 
a process that has, um, you know, ensured that the GMOs we have on the European market, mainly for food and feed uses, feed uses in particular, um, that they have, that they are safe. So in that context, we have a framework. It's it's not the youngest, not the freshest, but um, it is an existing framework. And indeed, the court has confirmed in its ruling in 2018 that genome edited products are covered by this um, GMO legislation. And I think that was also the moment when really the, the discussion was triggered. What does all of this mean? What does it mean for research? What does it mean for the for Europe and uh, the possibility of Europe to to use these techniques for, for various purposes? Now, you mentioned also the, the study that the Council has um, basically asked to the Commission um, it's a very comprehensive study. It's ongoing. You're right. The results will be there in April 2021. Um, but it is really there also to look into certain practical questions, one of which is, you know, detection. How, how can we detect? But the, the, the concept of this study is much broader. It looks into, you know, benefits, uh, concerns, uh, the ethical aspects, um, the robustness of risk assessment, um, also what are current and future scientific and technological developments? I mean, what are we seeing coming already onto the market in, in third countries, for example? And um, also concerning societal implica implication, ethical questions, and so on and so forth. So it's a very broad, very deep going study very much with the involvement of stakeholders and member states who have um, have provided us with this mandate. And um, by April 2021, as I said, the study should be delivered. And uh, the Commission may, um, if appropriate, um, you know, uh, present a legal proposal. I have to be very, very clear at this moment in time, the study is ongoing. We are doing this entirely open-minded. We want to see the results and the outcome um, and, um, you know, the, the decision on opening the regulatory framework or proposing something new and different is really still to come. So um, you had a very particular question on, you know, um, detection, um, do, how important it is to detect the technology behind. That is indeed correct. We also mandated the European Union reference laboratories to um, look into that question. And they will deliver a series of reports. But what is clear, if we speak about a known DNA alteration, it is very well possible to, to uh, develop detection methods. So detection in principle is feasible if we know what is the alteration. Um, we also asked uh, member states, because they are responsible for enforcement, also at the point of import, mm, you know, what is their experience, what strategies could there be. But I would also like to remind that experience from other sectors that we have in Europe, where you cannot detect um, with, a, with a method the, the claim or, or, the, or the, uh, the content, for example, say origin indication. I mean, there is no method in, in the true sense to, to uh, verify the origin of a product, but through other means like traceability, like paper trails, or in future we'll rather talk about blockchain, it is very well possible, you know, to, to find a, an alternative system to a detection method. So I think that should help us for the future and, um, in this context, I mean, to, to bluntly answer your question about, you know, a good regulation, not only for novel proof products, it should allow for innovative innovation. It should allow for confirmation of safety and safety in the widest sense. Um, I may refer also to our uh, recent strategy on the farm to fork um, for, for a sustainable food system. So we will be looking in future not only at safety, but also contributions to sustainability. 
and a good regulation in principle should allow you know for these objectives to be to be um, met it should allow also for europe to be a, a place for for research for for you know developing innovation and i would not now uh, really link it very very firmly to the detection method or the ability of of uh, detecting you know an, an alteration very good thank you thank you very you mentioned the farm to fork strategy, so it's time to turn to Wolfgang. Uh, the Commission with uh, DJ Agri in the driving seat has put forward its uh, ambition farm to fork strategy. And again, uh, this is what, what, what I mentioned before. It's about connectivity uh, between different areas, between uh, different stakeholders, between different topics. So the, the first question to you is, is a general question. How do you see the linkages between research and innovation on one side, but also plant breeders, farmers and consumers if uh, Europe wants to be a champion? Thank you very much, Marilyn, and good afternoon to the colleagues, and thank you very much for your kind invitation. Indeed, uh, the agriculture is facing quite some challenges. Uh, agriculture is victim of the climate change. Just look at the loss of harvests in Romania this year. But at the same time, uh, agriculture needs to become more sustainable because uh, we also contribute to deterioration of environment, biodiversity, climate. And the farm to fork strategy in that respect clearly indicates that farmers and agriculture has to contribute indeed to more sustainability. And you have seen the, the, the targets. It's about reducing risky pesticides. It's about using less fertilizer. And the question arises, what kind of research and innovation do we need to address these challenges? Because with our conventional methods, we will not really succeed. So I think everybody agrees that we require research and innovation to make agriculture more resilient, climate adaptation, but at the same time also to, to make agriculture more sustainable. So everybody agrees about research and innovation. And the font of fork strategy has also indicated that new technologies need to be looked at in this context. And I think uh, uh, um, Sabine has just pointed out the uh, procedure that will lead to this, uh, to this um, assessment. Now, I think what is, what is extremely important for us is in agriculture is that for the reasons I have uh, uh, just indicated, I think uh, research and innovation, including on gene editing is very important because it might constitute a tool to address exactly the challenges which we are facing. At the same time, it's also a question of competitiveness of the common of the agricultural policy for the reasons you have set out, uh, Marilyn. Now, evidently, we will look very carefully at the results of this uh, study, as uh, Sabine has just pointed out, and the uh, action, uh, further action will depend indeed on the uh, assessment of this uh, research. But I would like to make two, three points. I think it's very good to have excellent science and research, and I know it from my former business, but that's only half of the story. And the other story is the point that Viola has uh, referred to, Science needs to convince society and consumers because as agriculture, we are also interested in that we have markets and people are buying these products. So I think it is really crucially important, important that we have excellent science, but certainly equally important to convince society of the possible advantages of, that, of these technologies, at the same time point, pointing out the risks if there are. Now, I think a key question in this further discussion will certainly be, and uh, again, I refer, I do not anticipate the result of this of the study, is really the question uh, in the public debate and science uh, promotes that these techniques are solutions for many of the issues which we are facing, make agriculture more resilient. And I think it's very important that we can prove that this is true. And it's certainly interesting to see whether parts of these promises have been delivered with the conventional GMO techniques. 
I think somebody needs to be sure to say, listen, the new techniques, they might deliver better or, or even more targeted. So I think it's really important that this key element, that these new technologies need to be safe in terms of human safety, but also in terms of environmental uh, impact is, is very crucial. And we need holistic, uh, uh, holistic approaches in, in, this, in, this, in this domain. So this is what I would say at this point in time. And that's, uh, that's very good. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Can we turn to the industry now? Uh, Petra, can I come to you? And uh, so, yeah, you represent the plant breeding industry. Uh, there are already uh, some, um, some novel breeding techniques uh, that exist and that go far beyond the traditional ones uh, or beyond genetic engineering. And you are, as an industry, you must be interested in, uh, in remaining competitive or even in being more competitive. And obviously, this is a legitimate interest. So uh, with, uh, what is the position of the industry when it comes to regulating novel uh, breeding techniques in Europe? Thanks, Marilyn, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you also for, for inviting me to this uh, nice panel discussion. Um, yeah, indeed. So maybe I, I first introduce you a bit to, to the European uh, plant breeding and seed sector. So. It's a highly diverse sector um, and it's highly innovative. And, and why is it? Um, what we see is uh, our companies in reinvest up to 20% of their annual turnover into research and development. And that's uh, a huge amount of, of, of investments. And of course, they need to also um, recoup their investments from selling their respective products uh, on, on the seed market. So the EU seed market, is about 20% of the, of the global seed market uh, at the moment. And the breeding companies release around 3,500 new plant varieties per year to the European farmers. And uh, that's, that provides, of course, a wide variety of choice of, 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 of crops for, for the farmers to be able to grow competitive uh, products, uh, also in view of, of the global market, of course. Um, nevertheless, uh, we, we are a global sector as well, so, um, but we have, of course, local, local roots. Um, we did an internal survey uh, within our, our uh, uh, sector where we asked our companies if they are active in using these new breeding techniques uh, like genome editing. And 98% um, of the companies who replied to our questionnaire, which were uh, 62 companies in total, they are acting on a global level. So they are either having R&D facilities in different parts of the world, breeding facilities, they do seed sales and seed production on an international basis. So this means we are an international sector and of course, international competi competitiveness is key for us. So it, it, it doesn't make sense to only look into, let's say the national or the regional legislation and regulations, uh, a harmonized scope of regulatory oversight when we look at the global level is, is key for our, for our sector. And um, this can also be seen, so 20% we, we, of the seed which is produced worldwide is traded somehow between different parts of the world. And so um, our companies are very much interested in this, let's say, harmonized scope of regulatory oversight and how concretely do we look at that? And that uh, was mentioned already in this first session this morning. So we have a pretty similar position like the scientific posi uh, position which was presented by, by Leopoldina and DFG. So in our, in our view, um, we should not differentiate um, uh, uh, by looking at, at, a at technologies, but we should differentiate how these technologies are used and what the outcome of these technologies is. So having a look at, at, at a tool like genome editing doesn't make sense if you can use the tool in many different ways. It's the same if you would like to regulate the use of a hammer, for example. You can use it for putting a nail into the wall, but you can also use it to, to, to kill somebody. So uh, you, you need to look at the outcome. And, and uh, we, we have a very differentiated view. We say if the, the outcome is something which is similar to 
what you can also do by conventional breeding techniques. Um, and we addressed the issue of detectability and for especially distinguishability already, then it should not be regulated as a GMO because in the end you could have two similar products. One would be regulated as GM, the other would be a conventional uh, variety. So it, it would not okay. make sense to, 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 uh, to, to regulate them differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's our positioning. And for that, we would also suggest a, a targeted amendment of the, of the respective uh, basic regulations of the 2001-18 uh, directive. Understood. Thank you. Uh, we have two more voices to hear before we get into uh, the group discussion. So can I ask the, the next two speakers to, to go with brief uh, introductory remark? Uh, I'll just go to the farmers now, Pika. Um, so you, you're the voice of the farmers here. So I'll, I'll ask bluntly, do you see a role for genome editing in this transition towards sustainable agriculture? Thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity to take part in this panel discussion. Um, indeed, well, that's an easy, that's an easy question for, for a farming community. Irrespective of what we want, this will be a part of the reality that we will be facing. And um, I find it very strange, also professional, and I'm an agronomist myself, and, and when, when we look at the recent discussion in the EU, we're quite disappointed for the fact that um, it is the EU and the Western nations in general that actually have created the abundance of food and green revolution. We actually sustain billions of people in, in the planet, and they, most of them actually have sufficient foodstuffs. And, and in this respect, now when the European Union has had the internal talks, especially some of these technologies, we find it irrational, in fact, from the European Union own perspective, that we do not actually value our own scientific work and the progress that we have shown over the decades. It doesn't mean that we are without criticism when it comes to the outcome and that, that we need to be also realistic with. Um, and that's why Farm to Fork and the biodiversity strategies are really important as part of the Green Deal and supporting the CAP in coming up with uh, let's say alternatives, new ways of thinking, and especially from the environmental perspective. But it is quite often what, what the citizens want, the consumers cannot afford. And um, this is something that we need to keep in mind when, when we look at the, the market realities, because we are increasingly part of the international community when it comes to uh, trade. Like seed sector actually is one of the front runners in terms of being internationally linked all across borders. What happens inside the EU borders cannot, no, can, cannot, be, cannot remain only in, in the EU. Uh, and it, I, I would love to say that let's close the borders and let's say develop our own environment and our reality here. This is not, no longer realistic. And I would like to draw the attention to, your, to the ongoing discussion on, on uh, let's say for, for instance, livestock or how, we, how should we eat differently? Most of these alternatives that have been presented to the marketplace, especially like replacement of meat typically, is a, is a cocktail of chemical substances and highly international uh, industrialized process where I wouldn't eat it as a replacement of meat for the fact that it is not a natural product. I have no problem with the safety of the product and it may be kind of like acceptable, but if people say that GMO by definition is unacceptable because it interferes into the system and it is too artificial, how on earth are we going to justify, for instance, some of these replacements Take a look into the product declaration and you would see the difference with the natural products that we have in the marketplace. So we, we, don't, we are not very consistent in, in terms of consumer approach. But let's talk about what, what we need to do. And of course, um, we are very much interested in these technologies, especially gene editing for the fact that it actually gives us some um, alternatives. It actually could potentially replace some of the questionable technologies that we, we have employed in agriculture. They are not necessarily unsafe, but the, if the citizens say that they are no longer acceptable, we have to take a look into the alternatives. And in this respect, we, are, we put a lot of faith into the gene editing, um, genome editing in, in general. And if we look at historically what has happened over the past 100 to 150 years, I think we have to accept the fact that about 70% of the performance improvement in our productivity actually originates from better genetic material or both plants and livestock. 
we actually produce food with less environmental and um, let's say in general, uh, generally speaking, environmental footprint. And this is a general trend and general rule for all economic sectors. We have to improve our productivity. And this okay. is something that sometimes I miss in the EU statements. I would like to conclude by pointing out that while we talk about these technologies, we need to accept the fact that farmers and agri-food chain is there to produce food and in ensure food security. Secondly, we have to do that in a competitive manner, internationally increasingly. And then finally, why I'm here is that we defend the interest of farmers' economic, let's say, prosperity, and it is finally agricultural income that matters. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many points that are being raised by each of you that this discussion could go on for two hours. So there is, we have a scientist with us, and I think, um, Dirk, there is... Uh, the, how do you want to react from what you heard? There are so many uncertainties, so many question marks, especially on the consumer side. So do you want, well, that's a very tough uh, challenge. You have, let's say, two minutes to explain uh, what are the options on the table to reconcile the divergent opinions around uh, the use of genetic engineering. How do you want to, to do that? Thank you very, very much, Marilina, for this kind uh, introduction. Two minutes is very, very short uh, for such an important uh, uh, issue. Uh, like I would also like to thank the Leopoldina and the DFG for this um, uh, very interesting meeting and um, to give a plant scientist also a forum uh, like here. Of course, uh, all what we eat, uh, like is uh, what all what we produce for food is actually man-made. And over the centuries, actually, and of course, certainly in the last uh, decades, uh, science and plant scientists have been uh, greatly contributed to the success of this human activity. And so, and currently, actually, by a worldwide effort uh, of uh, plant scientists all over the world uh, during the last uh, four decades, in particular, with the discovery of DNA and so on, uh, we have now actually a very good understanding of uh, many genes and many processes which contribute to beneficial traits of crops, uh, being uh, disease resistant, food quality, efficiency, by which plants using nitrogen, phosphor, uh, uh, yield, and so on. But using this information in classical breeding processes is a really, really slow uh, process. And it takes often many years, actually, to introduce the desired uh, uh, trait uh, in the food uh, that we would like to consume. Uh, and I think uh, with uh, the current uh, climate crisis and uh, with the sustainability crisis, we don't have that time anymore. So in view of climate change and, like, and sustainability, we need to enhance the precision and the speed uh, like, by which we can develop um, new drought resilient crops, disease resistant uh, crops, crops with reduced environmental footprint. And uh, the question was asked, actually these examples are already there, actually they're already currently in a number of places actually uh, commercialized. Uh, like, and, um, and this is really completely in agreement uh, like, with the uh, Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy, in fact, uh, which states so that we have to develop innovative ways to reduce the dependency on pesticide fertilizers and so on. Like, and, but at the same time, to provide society with sufficient, nutritious, sustainable, and affordable food. So we uh, plant scientists uh, all over the globe, I have to say, unisono state that genome editing is an amazing techno breeding technology, achieving essentially the same as what we can do with classical breeding, but only faster, much more cost effective, and with a much greater precision. So, in many of the application of precision breeding, no foreign genetic information remains in the crop. And I can, I can tell you this consensus is also shared in, in Europe. Like, um, uh, we have, for example, like, um, um, an organization called EU SAGE, which stands for European Sustainable Agriculture Through Genome Editing which is re representing 132 European plant science centers across all, almost all uh, European countries, with the exception, I think, of Luxembourg and Malta, where not too much plant science is actually uh, happening. And we, we strongly argue that genome editing can really make uh, a great contribution to the development of a uh, productive, healthy, variety-rich, and eco-friendly agriculture. And such innovation-driven agriculture, I would say such modern agriculture, it can perfectly coexist with organic farming. But most importantly, it should not be banned from Europe as we will miss out on very critical innovations that, and, and also we will be subject to trade restriction that will jeopardize uh, European food security. 
Let me conclude with a final remark. So often the so-called precautionary principle is used uh, like for new technology. We discussed this already. But this this uh, principle should be proportional to the real risk and should not discriminate discriminate between those who can use genome editing and who uh, who cannot. Crops that will be subjected to target genome edited, which do not contain foreign DNA, do not present, in our view, any other uh, health or environmental risk than plants obtained through, class, uh, through uh, classical breeding technology. The features of the plant, rather than technique used to generate it, should determine its regulatory status. And we plant scientists also would like to call up on a kind of reverse precautionary principle and ask and can fact the society what will happen to European agriculture if breeders and scientists cannot use genome editing anymore while the rest of the world, which is actually the case, is embracing it. In such case, we might suffer more and more problems with drought, disease, low productivity, the necessity of the import of crops from other parts of the world. Is this the Europe that we want? It's time to call on all of us and from all kinds of uh, uh, opinions really to join forces and really to use uh, science and innovation to make agriculture and food production more sustainable in a world facing uh, problems with population, climate change, and environmental degradation. And to end with a um, quote to a famous person, listen to the scientist. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, well, uh, well uh, I'll ask a first question, okay, uh, to, to all of you. And then, Lucien, if you want, I'll come to you uh, just in a second if you, if you want to ask a few questions or to read out a few questions, a couple of questions from the audience. But just to get the discussion going, we've heard uh, that well, there's plenty going on from a research and innovation point of view. That's the excellent research we have in Europe. Doesn't, uh, it does, is just as good in that uh, novel breeding techniques area than in other areas. Uh, but I also hear that there's a very high level of caution uh, on the policy making sides and, uh, and also on the, on the Green Party in the Parliament. So uh, I want to, to ask, well, the, the, this novel breeding techniques are flourishing everywhere in the world. So don't you think that Europe also has a, a responsibility to regulate the use of these novel techniques and GMOs, as it successfully did with data protection or chemical product with bridge, or at its ambitioning to do with uh, with artificial intelligence, is it isn't it time to regulate to, to actually to to secure um, the proper use of uh, of these novel techniques? May I quickly <clears throat> reply to this? Yeah, I mean, is, yes, yeah. of course we will, uh, but I'm not so sure whether we will be the front runner of this. I mean, it doesn't have to be the green group. So there are others who are regularly much more in favor of, let's say, this innovative uh, genome editing um, uh, breedings. And, 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 and my, my problem is I'm the minority in this group and I share all what was being said before. So that's, that's, not, that's not the big deal. But I do consider that the majority of the group has a different opinion. And this is widely uh, shared also by the Greens in, I think, mainly all parties and all member states. And uh, as I said, it's not just the green consumer, it is, uh, I guess, the society. So I think what would help is really explaining what you're doing, what you're doing it for, and also maybe what my team has mentioned in the morning, um, taking some of the experience you have done in Asia and uh, Africa, where you obviously have empirical data. Uh, where is the health of the farmers uh, have improved with uh, the application of those uh, sorts? Uh, where is really a reduction of, uh, of pesticides, insecticides, uh, herbicides, and so on? And, and really show to the uh, broader audience here in Germany, really try to convince the people by the facts, I would say, and, and bring the researchers from those countries to Germany, let them explain why for their purposes, it makes more sense than to applicate those and to use those uh, breedings and genome editing sort. I mean, really try, try to, to, to explain why you want this, why it is important, why this progress is necessary for for Europe, but also for the global situation in, in terms of nutrition. This would be my advice, because I see always we are trying to convince 
the the least let's say uh, uh, affiliated ones but but start with a broader audience start in the schools start wherever you want but don't tell always the greens they have to be the front runner for this project i mean as i said i'm i'm more simple with this uh, um, with the whole approach than anybody else but nevertheless I see there's a big reluctance and not just in the Green Party but in the society as such. Wolfgang you seem to agree uh, do, you, do you have any advice in terms of improving science communications? I entirely agree because uh, I, I firstly agree with Dirk listen to scientists that's crucially important but it's not enough because you have to convince the society and politicians, they listen to scientists, but they have votes, they need majorities. So you need the society to convince. And I think what Viola has indicated and you have referred to is exactly what one needs. Examples that these techniques are able to address our sustainability challenges. You, you use less pesticide, you do this. But I think another element which I find personally very true and very important, and I'm agnostic on it. Dirk, you said there are hundreds and thousands of, of, of plant scientists. That is very good. But is it holistic? Have you checked with other people? What is the consequences on biodiversity? I have no clue what it is. But are these elements covered? We need holistic approaches. And I think that's also very important to convince people. I mean, it's also about the scale of changes that might have impact in many other areas. Are we really sure that these things are well, 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 well uh, assessed? So uh, I think again, for the reasons that Becker has, has set out, we are, <coughs> agriculture is certainly very favorable to take up these innovative techniques. But if you want to have a regulatory framework or politicians to go in that direction, you need to have these kind of assurances. Um, I completely agree that we need to have good examples and that we also need to show um, that we can deliver. I'm, I'm completely, I, I completely agree with this, but um, what I see is we, we are in a difficult situation. What we can show is plant breeding has delivered in the past to be to be uh, to to help agriculture to be more sustainable. I mean, we, we shouldn't um, ignore that plant breeding has always uh, already um, produced varieties which are more resistant to pests and diseases which allow more, uh, less uh, pesticide and fertilizer use. So that we have done in the past already and this is proven, it's a, it's a, it's a track record of success. But we also need to see that um, technology is, is going ahead. So we, we can be more efficient in that. And what we are doing with these new techniques is exactly we follow the same, let's say, goals, breeding goals, which we had in the past, be more pest resistance, et cetera, more yield with less resource or input, but with new technology. So it's, it's nothing which is completely changing, let's say, uh, re revolutionizing plant breeding uh, in view of its goals, but it's an additional tool in the toolbox of the breeder, which makes him or her more uh, able to 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 reach those goals and and I think we have this track record of success. We don't have it for those new technologies here in Europe yet, um, but we are in a bit difficult situation. As long as they are regulated as GMO, we won't have them on the market. We heard it earlier. There was no GM approval for cultivation since the end of the 90s, so we wouldn't be able to deliver if as long as those products are regulated as GMO. Of course, people in other parts of the world might be able to deliver and also show the success, but I can already foresee the, the counter arguments. Well, that might work for Africa, but that wouldn't work for Europe, show that it works for Europe. And for this, we are in a very difficult situation at the moment. Okay, Sabine, you want to come in very short because I'm told that yeah. there are many questions in the- Yes, of course. Audience. No, I mean, I think we have to be very clear, there is regulation and Petra just said it, they are regulated, new breeding techniques and their products are regulated under the GMO framework. So my question is really um, to the industry, to, to scientists, what level of different regulation do you want to see? Do you want to see total deregulation? 
do you want uh, do you accept um, that the the potential impact of any any product any outcome um, is assessed for safety for for health for environment for several aspects maybe also for its contribution to the sustainability agenda I mean, I'm trying to understand the argument because there is regulation, there is a way to the European market. Again, it is not an easy way um, on the one hand because of the scientific evidence, maybe, but also due to um, the political discussion around every authorization. So, I mean, I think we have to differentiate a little bit between the one scenario that says um, new breeding techniques are banned to the EU market not true, I don't agree. And we want something else, uh, more maybe adjusted to the risk. But where is the landing zone and how do um, you, the demandeurs, ensure that uh, the societal discussion is following? Strangely enough, the societal discussion has followed when we talk about the use of the techniques for, for, for medicines. Um, for the development of medicines. So very clearly, um, the, the, the citizens can differentiate where there's a clear benefit for them in their health and something which um, so far they have conceived as, you know, more pesticides, more um, industrial agriculture, more concentration, more, more, more of things that uh, deep down they don't want. So my question is, what are you really looking for? What would help? Thank you. Birk, you can answer to Sabine, but then I really have to turn to Dashen for a question from the audience. So go ahead. Yeah, just, to, just from a scientist point of view, we find it very difficult to understand why there would be a different legislation for something that you can obtain by breeding and something by genome editing. It's just a method which is different. And that's very hard to like, but it makes a, a huge difference. For example, if you now want to go with the genome editing the variety in the field trial, which is absolutely essential, if you want to, to really to, to bring something back to, to society, it's virtually impossible. In some countries, there's really legislation. It's very good. It's really classical GMO legislation. But the problem, like is like when it's so so difficult, so many rules attached to it, you can actually not do almost anything. And in some countries, I mean, Germany, France, and so on, I mean, uh, field trials have been destroyed. So it really blocks uh, any innovation in that field. Like, and, and of course, like uh, we as a society, we, we, we should think uh, whether we should allow for certain application. Maybe you can question whether you would allow for herbicide resistance and so on. I mean, that, that's quite obvious, but that's different from, from allowing at least uh, the uh, innovation to progress to value for society. Okay, Lushin, you go ahead. Do you want to pick two questions from Thank the audience? Thank you very much. Uh, lots of controversies on, on the chat, uh, as expected. Um, Marilyn, if you allow, I would pick two personal questions, because I think they summarize well the discussion. The first one is, um, um, is this actually not something of um, driven by, by all, all this discussion is not driven by demonstrating um, a social group identity and other put it like affirming a lifestyle and somebody putting I'm from Eastern Europe for us the question is how much can we afford uh, so this would be the first question to everyone um, should I put the second one or wait for the answers? no go ahead put the second one now second one is very interesting it came from somebody who says I'm a farmer myself I have a mid-sized uh, farm uh, in a European country whichever this is and says I'm, I'm um, pregnant by lots of dependencies, so much that I cannot do my real job of being a farmer. I'm dependent on plant breeders, I'm dependent on consumers, on politics, on young people, on television, on everything. Why can we cannot turn what we call a healthy agriculture? I don't really understand what this is. And there was another question about um, Thinking out of the box, like the, the farmer said, he had a long, long question. Why can't we think out of the box, for example, include genome edited plants for organic agriculture? So genome editing for organic agriculture or ecological intensification, or try to get back from the way agriculture is being done right now, cash crops, intensive agriculture, uh, rights of animals not being respected and all those things. 
So two personal statements where I try to sum up the really controversial discussion and I give it back to you, Marilyn. Becca, I think the second question is for you, isn't it? You just need to- Well, I, yeah. I, I actually appreciate the question because this is actually an answer itself. Like if we, if we put these barriers in place in our minds, we will never get the, the desired outcome. In fact, for instance, in organic, I met my organic farmer members and our, our, amongst our member organizations, and we always have the same discussion. They are really aiming at better in, in, improved production method for themselves in organic. So it's the same productivity increase that they aim at in organic. But the reality is that they don't have the toolbox like any conventional farmer has in the, for instance, with chemical substances. And I completely agree with the, with the, with the farmer asking the question that we, we are dependent and we are going to be dependent in future also on our regulators. But then the point here is that how do we ensure that in the, in the best of case, like organic farmers can actually develop their own production in the same manner that everybody else, because they will be in a very tough competition with this requirement for 25% of the land use. If we have 25% of the land use in organic, we will have a different kind of organic sector. It's not what we work for or want, but the, imagine the competitiveness of the organic sector that has to be enhanced in order to achieve that 25%. It's going to be a different sector what we know, know now. And I'm, my heart goes out to the organic farmers. How, they, how, how can they do that in their personal livelihoods and make it economically viable? So are you saying that organic agriculture and gene editing can actually work together? If, if, you, if you simplify that like that, the organic producers have to improve the also the same genetic material like everybody else, and I think some I think Dirk, Dirk made, uh, made a point that it's about time. The same time scale is imposed on organic farmers. The same adapt, adaptation to the environmental phenomena that they see, for instance, in prevalence of uh, disease and pest, is exactly the same thing. And the bigger the market share for the organic, the bigger the challenge is from the kind of conventional side that they would have. They face exactly the same phenomena. And in this respect, they need to be equipped like exactly the same thing, same way that everybody else. Look at the famous copper sulfate example. Why is it so sensitive for European agriculture? Because it's one of the last remaining tools to combat fungi. And we don't have a tool for the organic farmers to produce, for instance, in certain regions, wine. And if we lose these alternatives, that means effectively to those organic wine producers that they have to scale back or even stop producing their product. And this is not in the interest of society and definitely not the interest of the farmers and organic farmers that have made a huge investment into their production. So the same challenges are going to be there. They are not going to live in the bubble. Understood. Uh, so that's probably one of the cliché that just, just killed in a second. Thank you for that. Uh, who else wants to come in either on this, uh, on this second question on the, or on the lifestyle question? Anyone? The lifestyle question was actually addressed to Viola, but uh, I, everybody can answer, so... I have another one, another personal question from Yola, do you want to, to answer or no? You're muted. You just need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, there was a different button now. Uh, well, if you have another question, because I have to leave pretty soon, that's a little bit my problem. So I'm okay. a little bit under time pressure. If you have one more question where I could maybe um, together do a final statement, that would be great. Okay, well, I'll ask one, okay, because there is the, we need a consensus here, well, well let's dream, uh, but on how we can regulate. And so what should be the, the, the steps? We heard about the importance of science communications. We heard about the study at the commission. So what are the steps and what is a realistic uh, timeline to modify, to reverse the, the current uh, legislation? 
you know, that's a $1 million question. And as I said, since the majority, at least in my group, in my party, is, is not really in favor of uh, changing. And uh, for some of us, uh, where we try to open the process, I don't want to say we want to change everything. And there's no question about deregulation. It's just a, a question of what many people have said today, coherence, consistency in the regulation and, and, and also more evidence-based, uh, let's say, regulation where I'm very much in favor of. But nevertheless, um, I respect majorities and uh, the majority is not there, not even in the parliament. So um, I'm very much looking forward to this study, which will be published at the end of April. Um, I hope uh, this is a good starting point for, for new um uh, for new debates. Uh, I also would use maybe uh, the store a little bit more for, let's say, some site studies for off targets for different disputable questions where we could also already on the European level work on different issues. Um, and then, yes, uh, try to use the Horizon pro uh, program uh, for, for missions, for reach out, for trying to get uh, the scientific-based community uh, who is here now and who is very much committed, um, really try to, to prove and to show uh, what you can do and why it is not just a commercialized high industry agriculture behind you, but really what you have said and explained before, why could it be one milestone also for more sustainable, more for organic uh, and so on. So I don't want to convince anybody, but I would like to show, let's say, the portfolio of uh, opportunities to people and then they might decide. The question of, of labeling is, is, is still, of course, not solved because it will be very difficult, but people would like to have a possibility to get labeled um, and declarations. So this needs to be solved, and I'm ready to debate on this, but I know there are many, many people who wouldn't like to, um, to have any kind of uh, changes, and I do respect that, of course. And when, when final question for, for everyone here, and then we will wrap up, but uh, in his first day in the office, uh, the, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said he promised to liberate uh, UK bioscience from EU rules on genetically modified crops. So if and when the UK uh, leaves the EU pretty soon, it seems. So in parallel, some EU member states like, uh, like Czech Republic, but also Germany, if I'm not wrong, have shown some openness uh, to adopting this new breeding technique. So uh, there, there is a momentum here. And from what you said, Viola, uh, there, there could be uh, an engaged debate uh, also in the parliament. But so how do, we, how do we make sure, I mean, if the UK that is right at the door of the EU start doing its own thing, uh, shouldn't we just, what can we UK do? is almost far away, <laughs> more far away than anything else right now. So I wouldn't count on them. But of course, there will be a yeah, competitive situation in, in terms of research and uh, innovation, for sure. I don't know whether I would like to see this. Uh, as many have uh, laid out, it would be better to keep our researchers in the European Union, for sure. And uh, we have to see how we're going to deal with this uh, new competition um, on the island. But what can I comment on this? Yeah, let's see what they finally deliver and how this will be regulated or non-regulated. But um, so far, it's just an announcement, and Boris Johnson is great at announcing politics. <laughs> okay, that was a bit provocative. Final comment from anyone? Sabine. Yeah, uh, I mean. I think everybody agrees that, uh, you know, a debate is needed, a fresh debate is needed because we have, so to say, uh, new tools. We understand uh, better or through the help of scientists, you know, what can be achieved with these tools, how these could be used in a more democratic way. Um, the Commission has, um, as I referred to, launched the farm fork strategy. I mean, Commissioner Kiriki is uh, responsible for health and, and food safety. She has been, you know, carrying that work forward uh, in, in the Commission. And um, what this other aspect of sustainability 
food sustainability, you know, with the dimensions of economic sustainability, health and, and environmental sustainability. What these offer is for us in Europe to discuss on the way forward, you know, what type of innovation we would like to welcome to Europe. You know, in, in this work, I mean, safety, no doubt. I mean, I don't think anyone is, is in any way uh, opposed to safety for health and the environment and some sort of assessment um, that new products that we are seeing, be it to, through NG, NGTs or other, other tools which also exist, that this is fundamental to confirm safety. But I think the discussion out there and the societal concern is also around other aspects that I would summarize under the, the sustainability criteria. And what makes me um, um, optimistic is that in going forward on implementing the farm to fork strategy, in defining a legislative framework for sustainable food systems, so in defining what is sustainability for us in Europe, what is important to us, the environment, uh, the social rights of worker and so on and so forth, we can also more and more frame, you know, what type of innovation in the food area, for example, we would like to see in Europe. And if that discussion is, is well argued, well founded, we have the good examples, like we have, for example, in the, in the medicinal area, um, you know, the, the, the atmosphere and the, and the quality of discussion might change. So this discussion is needed. Everyone has to contribute with what they can contribute with. Um, the, the delivery of the study is an opening for that discussion, in particular as the Council requested, so member states um, at large are ready to open this discussion. And obviously we will, time has to tell, you know, in which direction we are going, but we have not to be one-dimensional in this discussion. There are so many aspects that all need to be considered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Those are very wise words. So I think this is a good summary and so we will wrap up here. It is, uh, there is plenty of space for a debate and it's probably fair to say that now more than ever there is um, space for every voices to be heard. So scientists have a, a very um, have a very important task here in terms of communicating probably uh, jointly with the uh, with the industry and uh, and farmers do also have uh, uh, their say obviously so uh, with this I'd like to to thank very much our six speakers um, apologize we ran a little bit over time but that's because we started a bit later and I thought it was important to have uh, this debate uh, so we will now take a break and, uh, and the next panel uh, will start at 2.30 uh, CET, so in about 20 minutes, uh, 18 minutes. So please come back, the, the, panel, the next panel will look at socioeconomic and uh, environmental concerns of GMOs. So nope, the debate is not over for today. Thanks Thank again, you. and yeah, we'll, uh, we, we wish you uh, the best. Bye-bye. Bye, many thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.